Welcome to a special conversation with B'nai B'rith International, the latest in our expert analysis series. I'm CEO Dan Mariashin. We appreciate your spending some time with us today. The topic today is Iran. While the administration has signaled a wish to return to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the JCPOA, Iran's policy has been one of spite, as every week brings news of some new breach of the agreement by the regime in Tehran. Much has been written about how things have changed on the ground over the past several years, and lessons learned since the JCPOA agreement was announced more than five years ago. Iran continues to pursue nuclear weapons and a ballistic missile program, exerts strong influence in Syria, backs Shia militias in Iraq, continues to build up Hezbollah's arsenal with shipments of precision-guided weapons in Lebanon, backs the Houthis in Yemen, and has a close working relationship with Hamas in Gaza. In other words, Iran's behavior in the region has given new meaning to the term malign behavior. Well, here to delve into this issue in detail are two leading Middle East experts, Jonathan Chanzer and Michael Singh. Dr. Jonathan Chanzer is Senior Vice President for Research at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, where he oversees the work of the organization's experts and scholars. Jonathan previously worked as a terrorism finance analyst at the U.S. Department of Treasury, where he played an integral role in the designation of numerous terrorist financiers. He's held previous think tank research positions at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and at the Middle East Forum. He's written hundreds of articles on the Middle East, testifies frequently before Congress, and publishes widely in the American and international media, appearing on channels such as CNN, Fox News, and Al Jazeera. Michael Singh is the Lane Swig Senior Fellow and Managing Director at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. He's a former Senior Director for Middle East Affairs at the National Security Council from 2005 to 2008 where he was responsible for devising and coordinating U.S. national security policy in the region, with a particular emphasis on Iran's nuclear and regional activities. He's written extensively on the Middle East and broader U.S. national security strategy. His writing has appeared in the Washington Post, the New York Times, Foreign Affairs, and more, and he has appeared as a commentator on CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, and other outlets. Jonathan, Michael, glad to have you with us today. Thank you, good to be with you. Thanks, Dan. Well, Iran and its uh, nuclear capabilities have featured prominently in the news of the past week or two. So let's begin with uh, the new administration's decision to attack a base used by Iran-backed Shia militias in Eastern Syria uh, in response to an earlier attack on US targets in Iraq. What do you make of this decision and what does it signal, particularly within the context of possibly going back to the table with Iran? Uh, Jonathan, we'll begin with you. Sure. Thanks, Dan. And thanks for the opportunity to, to speak with you and, and to your uh, subscribers and supporters. Um, look, I, I would say that the attack was, was probably a surprise to many. Um, I think many believe that the Biden administration would be let's just say taking a, uh, maybe a, a softer touch with the Iranians, uh, perhaps demonstrating an eagerness to run back to the JCPOA and not responding the way that they did. Although I will say in the same breath that the decision to attack, um, you know, I think the, the way that the attack took place, it didn't happen in Iraq. So th there was a, already a, sort of a hedge uh, it took place in Syria, where the fallout would be significantly less severe. Um, it was a very uh, pinpoint and surgical strike uh, that probably had minimal impact on the infrastructure of these uh, uh, popular mobilization units uh, that the U.S. seeks to strike. That all said, I think there was an important message sent to Iran that the U.S. is not going to uh, uh, allow for their malign behavior to continue unabated, that there is at least uh, there is going to be some level of scrutiny of what Iran is doing and that, that, that the nuclear deal that the U.S. seeks to reenter, that they will not do so in the myopic fashion, perhaps, that we saw in the past. This would be, if this is the case, a step forward. Um, and an improvement on what we saw during the Obama years. 
I'm still concerned about a return to the Iran deal, but again, some of the right messages sent. Michael, what's your take on on the attack and what it means, and and also if you comment on the kind of the jockeying that's been going on since. The, the U.S. has uh, signaled an intention to, to go back into some kind of negotiating uh, setting uh, with Iran. Uh, Tehran recently rejected a, a, an EU offer of trying to broker direct talks. Um, Rafael Grossi, the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, just said yesterday uh, that Iran shouldn't be using the issue of inspections uh, as a bargaining chip. How do you see all of that playing out? Hmm. Thanks, Dan. It's a it's a real pleasure to be to be with you and to be with John as well. Look, I, I think John is right about the uh, strike in Syria. I think it sends a number of of useful messages. One, of course, and the and the primary message is that the U.S. can walk and chew gum at the same time, so to speak. That even as the Biden administration pursues a return to nuclear diplomacy, um, it's not going to hesitate to exercise deterrence. Um, whether uh, that is um, in direct response to something which has happened, for example, in Iraq, uh, or hopefully also in, in response to, to plotting, which, uh, which we detect around the region. Um, deterrence is not something that's a one-off. Uh, it's something that uh, requires uh, constant vigilance, frankly. We've seen this, for example, from Israel's own campaign of strikes in Syria. Um, and, and I think that sends an encouraging message, not just um, to adversaries, but I think it'll encourage our, our partners and allies in the region as well. But I think they also, um, at the same time, made clear that uh, they're going to uh, pursue that in a sort of reciprocal manner, that they're not looking for escalation in the region, um, but what they're looking to do is, is really to deter. And again, I think that message will be well received by allies as well, who, who sort of want the U.S. to strike this balance between pushing back on Iran, but also um, not going too far in terms of threatening regional stability ourselves. And then third, I, I do think the fact that it took place in Syria, the fact that there was a, a pause between the attack on February 15th in Erbil and the U.S. response demonstrates a, a desire to consult and coordinate with allies, in this case, the government in Baghdad. Um, and again, I think that's, that's a positive thing. When it comes to the larger picture that you mentioned, Dan, look, I, I think that President Biden has indicated that he sort of has two policy goals in mind. One is a mutual return to the JCPOA with Iran, followed by, in, in quick succession, uh, a subsequent negotiation on a stronger, more comprehensive agreement with Iran. Um, I, I think, though, that what we're seeing right now from the Biden administration uh, is patience, frankly. And, and that, again, is a good thing. Um, there isn't a rush to, to simply go back into the nuclear deal at any cost. Um, there isn't a willingness to overlook or excuse Iran's own violations of the nuclear deal. Um, and that's, I think, something uh, that should be encouraging to anyone who was sort of less than perfectly satisfied with the JCPOA. So, for example, in uh, Vienna at the, at the IEA, we have seen the U.S. Uh, and our European partners, the U.K., France and Germany, uh, as well, together with uh, Rafael Grossi, the director general of the IEA and his, uh, his staff, um, show a willingness to call Iran out for its violations uh, of the nuclear deal, both, um, and frankly, its uh, other activities beyond the nuclear deal, these anthropogenic uh, uranium particles, so to speak, man-made uranium particles found at different sites uh, around Iran, despite the fact that, again, the U.S. has expressed a desire to enter into diplomacy with Iran. And so I expect that what we'll see, uh, that what we are seeing is an effort by Iran to push back, uh, an effort by Iran to maximize its own leverage and to get the, the best deal it can for itself. Um, and again, that's going to standing up to that and sort of uh, in, in ensuring that the U.S. isn't put at a disadvantage is going to require uh, a certain steeliness and a certain patience from the administration. Um, and I'm pleased to see that they have exercised patience so far. Let's take a look at Iran from a different angle. Uh, what, what is the situation in Iran uh, domestically? And uh, speak about, if you would, the upcoming elections um, in Iran, how, how that might affect all of this. You know, the, the last time around, uh, or for years, actually, uh, we always heard about hardliners and moderates. And, and, and it, it turned out at the end of the day, particularly with the vetting system that goes on in Iran before any kind of presidential uh, candidates are uh, actually emerge. 
uh, it really doesn't make much difference. Uh, you know, maybe a little bit here, a little bit there, but but certainly not on this particular program. So, Jonathan, talk about the domestic situation and, and what that might mean going forward. Yeah, I mean, look, I think it, it's a good question, and I think right now, you know, the important thing to note is that Iran is really on its heels. That the maximum pressure campaign that um, was enacted by uh, former President Donald Trump. Um, I, you know, I think, you know, you hear a lot of people criticize it. You hear a lot of people say that it wasn't effective. But really, at the end of the day, the economy in Iran is in really bad shape. You know, inflation, uh, unemployment. Um, and of course, all of this exa exacerbated by the COVID-19 crisis and the, the global contraction of the economy. So this is a country that is really um, in, in dire straits right now. I think, uh, you know, we, we've seen um, intermittent protests. We've seen challenges to the regime from, uh, you know, uh, on the ground. You have a sense right now that the, that the country is in, um, is really quite weak. And, and this, of course, raises, you know, really obvious questions about why we want to go back in and provide sanctions relief to a malign country or malign um, regime, rather, that, um, you know, where we have this significant leverage, why we would give them sanctions relief, why we would give them a rescue right now. This is actually, to a certain extent, a replay of what we saw in 2013, where U.S. sanctions and international sanctions had really hammered uh, the Islamic Republic. They were on their back foot and we gave them a lifeline. So this is, I think, the important context for understanding why we might even consider getting back in, into the JCPOA right now. Given the leverage that we have, I think there are more things that the U.S. can ask for um, beyond the kind of myopic terms of the agreement as uh, defined last time around, whether that's regional activity, whether it's missiles, whether it's human rights violations. All of these things, I think, are certainly within the scope of what the U.S. should be addressing. And the concern, of course, is that that won't be what the Biden administration does. Well, this doesn't mean that they definitely won't. It's just the concern, I think, right now that we all continue to voice um, as we see that leverage and the potential for it to be squandered. As for the political situation in Iran, um, look, you know, there are a lot of people who like to game out who the moderates are, or who the hardliners are. I think, as you indicate, there is really no major difference um, it, it substantially, right? The, the key here is that there is a supreme leader uh, of the Islamic Republic who ultimately makes these big choices, these big decisions. And that man continues to vilify the West, continues to defy the West, and uh, it matters very little. We actually hear from some that it will be important uh, to try to lock down an agreement before the election so that we can um, guide things in the right direction with the right kind of leadership. I am not sure that that is correct. In fact, I would argue that it's not. I think it probably doesn't matter much. It's really a talking point by the regime. It's an attempt by the regime to gain leverage over the West. So again, I, I think that there is a real opportunity to use the leverage that we have given the current circumstances on the ground in Iran. Um, and the hope anyway is that the Biden administration won't squander it. Now, Michael, how do you see it? And also, um, how do you see the the Iranians reacting to uh, what appears to some as, as an eagerness to go back, uh, an eagerness here, uh, to go back into a negotiation. Well, when it comes to the uh, elections in Iran that, that are slated to take place this June, look, I, I think that um, what we've seen over multiple uh, elections in Iran is that um, these haven't uh, been free and fair elections. Um, and I think that Look, this is something that um, where, where I tend to uh, agree with with John, where we we do need to be willing uh, to speak up for the rights uh, of Iranians uh, to uh, to exercise their their civic rights, to exercise their human rights, uh, and we can't be deterred from doing that. I think also, regardless of the outcome of those elections, we need to continue to pursue our interests. We can't allow uh, Iran's uh, electoral calendar, Iran's domestic politics, uh, to sway the decisions that we are making about our uh, uh, core interests in the region. When it comes to your question about uh, the, the perception of eagerness for the US to return uh, to the JCPOA, look, I go back to what I, I said before. I think what we have now in the United States is, is actually a bipartisan consensus that we do need something stronger. We need a more robust uh, agreement of some kind. We need a more robust policy towards Iran. 
Uh, and I think achieving that will be difficult. Uh, and I think achieving it is going to require patience. Um, and, and certainly the way to achieve that is not to, not to rush, not to succumb to pressure, um, uh, even though Iran obviously will try to place pressure and sort of create a sense of urgency. And we've already seen them do that, uh, both through their nuclear steps as well as perhaps through their regional steps. I have to say, for my part, I, I think that um, right now the Biden administration uh, has uh, sent good signals. It has sent signals that it is not going to rush back into the deal, despite some urging it to do so, um, that it is uh, going to try to ensure that there is a sort of subsequent deal, which is a stronger deal. Um, and I think that they're to be commended for that patience. Um, so, look, I think what we should expect, though, is we should expect to see Iran continue to try to raise the pressure on the United States, both diplomatically and through other means, uh, to make decisions, um, perhaps in a sense of haste. Uh, and that, again, will take some patience and it'll take some, some toughness to, to resist. Well, at the end of January, uh, Israel's um, military chief, uh, Lieutenant General Aviv Kochavi, uh, cautioned uh, the current administration against rejoining the 2015 nuclear deal, uh, even if it toughens uh, the terms. Uh, and Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, recently told uh, Israel's Channel 11 News that Iran was uh, behind the explosion that hit an Israeli-owned cargo ship in the Gulf of Oman uh, last week. And Netanyahu again clarified that Iran, quote, will not have nuclear weapons with or without an agreement. Now, Israel has shown that it's uh, determined also to block Iranian moves in Syria, uh, such as the delivery of those precision guided munitions. Now, one of the one of the elements that was left out, many people believe, in 2015 was that Israel and other regional players, Gulf states in particular, were not present uh, either at the table or near the table when all of these negotiations were going on. And it's great for the Europeans to be talking about this. Uh, or the Russians and the Chinese, but at the end of the day, um, most of those countries, if not all, are not in the crosshairs of the Iranians. So, and and the the analogy was made to Korea, where South Korea and Japan were consulted uh, all the time on negotiations going on with with North Korea. So we bring this back to a to a JCPOA two. Um, I understand in recent weeks, last couple of weeks, there is some mechanism that has been set up for some kind of consultation between Israel and the U.S. on this issue. How do you see this going forward? If we go back to the table, um, where does that where does that leave Israel in the mix? Jonathan. Yeah. So, you know, one thing that I, I think is just important to note here, I mean, I think um, I think Mike and I generally agree on on a lot of things. I would say, though, that um, the idea that the Biden administration is showing a certain amount of patience right now, I, I, I'm not sure that that's an accurate description. I think, you know, it, it was fairly remarkable to me that within, you know, just a few short weeks uh, of, of uh, you know, of assuming power that we saw this White House start to talk about a deal when the Iranians didn't put it on the table. In other words, it was really the U.S. that seemed to introduce the topic. It does seem to be that the U.S. is pursuing this issue. And, and so I think there does appear to be an eagerness um, on the part of Obama administration alumni uh, who are, I think, looking to resume their life's work or you know, their, the, the most uh, significant achievement, at least in their eyes, of, 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 uh, of the Obama administration. So. I think it's important to note here that there does appear to be um, a sense of eagerness on the part of the U.S., and I'm concerned that the uh, regime in Iran may seek to take advantage of it, as I think they did the last time around. As to some of the other things that you noted, um, that speech by Aviv Kohavi was remarkable, um, nothing short of remarkable, that you you actually saw a um, a a professional uh, military man come out and engage in, in, a, in what was largely described as a political issue, warning the United States, this is not something that we've seen in the past. Um, and the idea that, you know, he introduced that they're dusting off old plans to strike Iran's nuclear infrastructure, a bold threat by the IDF chief of staff. So really, I think you see the Israelis um, stepping up in, in maybe in some new ways, uh, signaling that there could be significant conflict on the horizon. And of course, that is exacerbated by what we just saw in the Gulf of Oman, the attack on this Israeli vessel, 
uh, as well as the ongoing attacks that the Israelis have been carrying out in Syria as a means to prevent Iran from shipping these precision guided munitions or PGMs to Hezbollah. So there is tension across the region right now. I think the Israelis are um, in kind of another zone, if you will, when it comes to kinetic attacks. Um, the, the issue about Israel not being part of the, um, uh, the actual negotiations with Iran, I think is a sore point. Um, the Israelis remember what happened last time around, the fact that they, they had a voice, but it was not a voice at the table. It was a consultative um, arrangement that they had with the United States, but that at the end of the day, the U.S. went forward regardless of what the concerns were. What's interesting right now, in my opinion, Dan, is that now you have other countries from the region that have um, made peace with Israel. So you've got the, you know, the Emiratis, you've got the Bahrainis, maybe the Moroccans. I'm not sure about whether the Sudanese are going to get involved in this. But also, don't forget the Egyptians, Jordanians, others that have a voice here. They're all within rocket range uh, or missile range of the uh, of the Islamic Republic. They have important critiques to share. They have concerns that need to be shared. If they are um, only allowed in in that consultative fashion, where they are going to be one step removed from the negotiations, it is it's it's a real weakness in in the U.S. strategy. In fact, uh, I have a piece that came out uh, uh, in Newsweek with uh, FDD CEO Mark Dubowitz, where in many ways I think we can describe this as an America first strategy that we are ignoring the legitimate concerns of our allies around the region to pursue a myopic deal. Um, in the narrowly defined interests of the United States without thinking about what the rest of the world thinks about this. And relying on the P5 plus one is really not the answer because these are countries that are not in missile range. These are the ones that are not going to be directly impacted by Iran's nuclear program and all of its malign activities. So some really interesting questions I think that the Biden administration is going to have to wrestle with when it comes to the new constellation of allies that are forming in the region. Michael, where is uh, Israel, uh, do you think, on this as it goes forward? And what about the, the consultation issue? Hmm. Well, look, I, I think obviously we're always going to put American interests first. There's no doubt about that. That's the responsibility of our government. But it's important to recognize that if you don't have regional partners on board, if you don't have allies on board and, and take into account their uh, concerns, then whatever deal you make, whatever policy you construct, um, may may be doomed to fail. Uh, and it's also important to recognize that your allies, and I would say especially Israel in this regard, can actually amplify your power and your strength um, when you're confronting adversaries. And so I think it's not so much about U.S. interests versus other interests. It's about mutual interests and how do we kind of work with those like-minded countries uh, to advance a common agenda. And that's what we need to do here. So, so look, um, I, I don't think that it means that we necessarily need to include every every interested country and frankly every issue in some kind of grand negotiation with Iran. I, I frankly am a bit skeptical um, that we're going to to reach an agreement on everything with uh, with Tehran. Um, I, I'm I have my doubts that frankly uh, any agreement uh, that is sustainable uh, is reachable with Iran. We can try, but we need to nest those efforts in a robust regional policy that safeguards those mutual interests regardless of what agreements are or are not reached. That to me is the key insight. Um, it's, it, we shouldn't view these negotiations, we shouldn't view diplomacy any more than we view sanctions or military action as some kind of silver bullet. We need to bring all of our uh, tools to bear uh, and have a robust policy that safeguards our interests. Now look, the, the US uh, and Israel are going to have disagreements. That's been that's been clear across multiple administrations. What I think is key is that uh, we approach those disagreements uh, in a spirit of friendship and partnership. In other words, let's have those disagreements privately to the extent we can. Let's try to understand one another's positions. Let's share intelligence and information. Uh, and then let's do what we can to present a united front um, to our adversaries. I think that will be that will be important. Our our Regional partners other than Israel, the Emiratis, the Saudis, and so forth, um, sometimes have different concerns than the Israelis. Um, and that's, I think, where we're going to, again, have to exercise some diplomacy um, to kind of bring some sort of regional coalition together uh, to advance, again, a common agenda, both with respect to Iran, as well as, frankly, to some other things. I, I tend to think 
that actually one of the best things we can do to counter Iran is to strengthen some of our partners um, so that there aren't those opportunities for Iran to exploit in the region. Where, where Iran is most successful uh, is where there is weakness, where there is chaos in places like Syria, in places like Lebanon, in places like Iraq. Uh, and so buttressing the sort of existing regional security, improving it, um, helping to knit those partners together should uh, be at the top of the agenda as well. So what, what would a uh, going back to the table situation uh, look like? The negotiations uh, leading up to uh, the JCPOA in 2015 uh, disappointed many uh, by focusing exclusively on Iran's nuclear program um, as the, the issue of uh, ballistic missile development was left at the side. Uh, malign behavior, the support for terrorism, human rights issues, uh, regional provocations, um, and uh, and other issues, uh, particularly for the Jewish community, um, Iran fomenting anti-Semitism, the anti-Zionism, and Holocaust denial, all of that. And as you note, Michael, um, the likelihood of everything being included in, in an agreement um, is probably not very high. But at the same time, this was only six years ago. And so now, you know, we see the French foreign minister said a couple of weeks ago, my gosh, you know, I don't believe this. They're, 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 they're breaching every particular uh, aspect of the JCPOA that, you know, we were, we're so surprised. It's very much like that scene in Casablanca where uh, he's shocked, shocked that there's gambling going on here in this establishment. So what would a negotiation look like if, if you're going to make it better? Um, what what has to be included here so that we don't have five years down the road or six years down the road, we go through the same thing? Uh, Jonathan? Sure. Um, look, f first, I think that there are the holes that existed in, in the previous um, agreement, right? I mean, it was a myopic agreement. It was narrowly focused on the nuclear issues. But even there, they didn't address uh, the possible military dimensions properly of Iran's nuclear program. We found out after the fact, after the Mossad raided a warehouse in Iran that, uh, that was not even on the radar of the IAEA. So the Israelis come out with all this new material pointing to Iran's previous um, weaponization uh, activities that, you know, where we, we were assured by the IAEA and by the UN and by the P5 plus one that these were things that would never happen, that we would never find out things by surprise, that every pathway to a nuclear weapon were, were going to be cut off. There are now uh, at least two uh, locations where there are man-made uranium particles that were not on the radar, again, uh, of these same entities that assured us that every pathway to a nuclear weapon was closed. Um, you have the potential for a plutonium path to be reopened after assurances that uh, the uh, the facility that would be responsible for, for creating that plutonium path was shut down by the Iranians. And so there are many, many questions that still exist on the nuclear file alone. And that's why a lot of people right now are saying, look, you know what, we didn't like it last time that it was myopically focused on the nuclear issue, but maybe let's lock this down for real this time. Let's actually address all the nuclear issues that have been raised, some of the concerns that the IAEA are poking around on right now, because clearly we didn't do a good job of it the last time around. The other sort of side of the argument is that we need to address all of these other issues as well. And those issues, of course, relate to missiles. It relates to uh, the PGM production that we're seeing, the precision guided munitions, the activities in Yemen. There are all these other malign activities that we know that Iran has been involved with. Of course, the PMUs in, in Iraq, the, the Shiite militias that have basically hollowed out the government there. These are all issues that Iran has pursued um, while being compliant with the deal or not being compliant with the deal, depending on how you look at it. But in the post-JCPOA era, these things have all continued. So we are looking at a huge portfolio of issues that need to be addressed. Some people are saying, let's bite off one piece at a time and actually, you know, let's, let's actually address it in, in a complete form. I don't know how any of this can be done with the current regime and with its DNA. Um, what we're asking the, the regime to do is to change its very nature. And this is the main concern that I have when, when looking at the totality of these issues. Uh, and so per, perhaps that's why those that are looking to just solve the nuclear issue first, maybe they're onto something. Now, Michael, let me throw another uh, issue into this discussion, this particular discussion, because it seems that our, our European partners, at least those in the, in the uh, 
P5 plus one, um, have different objectives or different expectations or um, uh, say not as, as high as what we might have here, certainly not where the Israelis are. Um, how will those differences be bridged uh, if, if everybody goes back to the table? The difference between ourselves and the Europeans? Ourselves and the Europeans, exactly. Well, look, I, I think that there is a sort of common agenda that we, we all do share, even though we have definitely differed when it comes to approaches to addressing them, right? So I think we can agree with our uh, partners in Europe that Iran should be prevented from acquiring a nuclear weapon. That's, that's something that um, historically, even the Russians and Chinese ha have agreed with us on. Um, we, I think, can agree that um, we need to counter Iran's uh, policies in places like uh, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, and so forth. Uh, I think we can agree uh, about the danger that Iran's development of missiles and its proliferation of missiles and other advanced weapons pose to the region. Uh, I think where it gets difficult is then talking about, well, what do we do about those things? Um, I think what's, what's important, and this goes back to your question to John, Dan, is that we'd be very focused on what are our objectives, but then be sort of, uh, sort of as pragmatic as we can about how we're going to accomplish those things. Uh, I think that it would be a mistake to say, well, we have to put everything into an agreement or we have to um, sort of predetermine uh, the tactics that we're going to use to achieve this goal. Um, because frankly, I'm, I'm not sure at this stage how that, how that will work out. What is achievable in a diplomatic agreement will be in part determined by um, what all the different parties of that agreement uh, are willing to discuss. But that doesn't mean you set aside your objective. It may mean that you need to reach for different tactics uh, to accomplish those objectives. So, so I think that bridging these differences with Europeans starts with making sure that we have a clear sense of our common objectives um, and that we then are willing to bring lots of different tools to the table to accomplish them. Diplomacy, yes. Um, economic pressure, yes. A military deterrence uh, and so forth. Um, and it may be that different, different members of this coalition uh, play different roles uh, in terms of using those different tools. I will say, though, Dan, I think one thing that often gets left out that shouldn't get left out, and it goes back to sort of what should we do differently this time, is that we also need to have bipartisanship here in the United States. Uh, I think that it's just not um, conceivable that a diplomatic agreement will be sustained or will stand, as we've seen over these past eight years, if there isn't a, a, a sort of minimum sufficient domestic coalition, in addition to that regional coalition, in addition to the transatlantic coalition, we need a domestic coalition that can support the policy. And so one thing that we need to see is we need to see the administration work hand in glove with Congress and vice versa uh, to come up with a policy that can be sustained over multiple administrations. Uh, so we don't see this kind of pendulum swinging back and forth uh, between totally different policies. Let's talk about the uh, malign behavior, because it, to many it appeared that because there was this kind of uh, bubble around the negotiation on the nuclear program, that all of the other activity that the Iranians were engaged in, all of this hegemonistic uh, activity, uh, beginning in Syria and Iraq, and, and of course, uh, Lebanon is, is basically Iran Inc., uh, given Hezbollah's role. Uh, in, in Lebanon, um, how is it possible to, and it, it appeared as if the Iranians were kind of given a free pass on that as long as they signed on to the JCPOA. How do we deal with the rest of the activity, which clearly um, uh, has given the Iranians an opportunity to do what they can do now, the nuclear program maybe some years down the road, but this is an opportunity now for them to expand their influence in the region. So how do we address that at the same time that we're addressing the nuclear program? Jonathan. Look, you're asking, I think, one of the more important questions that wasn't asked last time around. I believe that there was a tacit green light to the clerical regime in Iran to pursue a range of regional malign activity, and it's only grown worse um, in the intervening years. So, you know, I think the key here is to actually address each one of these portfolios individually to prioritize them um, and, and to really start to, to tackle them. So, um, you know, Yemen is an interesting one. I think we've seen a misstep on the part of the administration um, in its early weeks by delisting the Houthis as, as a terrorist organization before getting uh, concessions 
by the uh, Islamic Republic as they are the, um, the patrons of the Houthi movement in Yemen. I think there was an opportunity to say, look, we want to delist you. We want to delist the Houthis, but only if we see certain things begin to happen. And I think that's that's a mistake. I do think that, of course, that is a very, very complicated portfolio given the famine and, and the humanitarian crisis that's happening there. Uh, but I think the U.S. Has, has lost some of its leverage. With Iraq, uh, I think you know we need to do a better job of trying to root out some of these Shiite militias that I think have really gained too much power um, in, uh, uh, in the country over the last uh, half decade or more. That, of course, happened under uh, Obama's watch as well as under Donald Trump's watch. So I believe that the Biden administration has a lot of work to do. It's not an easy thing to do, given that there is a delicate diplomacy that's happening right now with this country that is really, um, it's gone through the ringer politically. Um, Syria, huge problem. I, you know, I would say that most of the former Obama administration officials that work this file look back on that as, a, uh, as an area where they have regret. Um, that they allowed for the humanitarian crisis to grow, that they allowed for the slaughter of the Syrian people because we looked the other way. And so I think we have um, maybe no easy answers, but certainly I think looking at sanctions, looking at other pressure on the regime um, and on Iran there would be uh, very important. But I think the most important portfolio right now, at least in my view, is uh, the Lebanon portfolio, the precision guided munitions that uh, Hezbollah has amassed. And we don't know exactly what the numbers are. There are probably a few hundred in their possession right now, but they are what the Israelis call game-changing weapons. These are weapons that they could potentially target with great accuracy uh, Iran's nuclear uh, or uh, Israel's nuclear facilities. They could target Israel's chemical um, uh, plant in Haifa. They could hit the, uh, the Kiria, which is sort of the, the Pentagon uh, of Israel in Tel Aviv, and they could potentially evade uh, Iron Dome and uh, some of the other missile defense systems that Israel has developed. This has the Israelis on high alert. It's one of the things that the Israelis have prioritized. In fact, they've actually noted this is the number two defense priority for them, neutralizing the PGM uh, program. Just it's, It just comes right after the nuclear program in Iran. So they're very, very concerned about this as the thing that could prompt the next war in the Middle East. And so there needs to be a lot more done to neutralize those PGMs, to remove them from the country. And here, I think we have an interesting opportunity. The United States, we fund the Lebanese Armed Forces, the LAF. The LAF is responsible for controlling this territory from a military perspective. And I think that they're probably the only chance we have right now to remove these in a non-kinetic fashion. Otherwise, I think we're very likely to see the Israelis strike first. And that, of course, raises all sorts of questions about what happens in the wider region. But all of these portfolios, um, I think, have, you know, you see Iran with leverage. Uh, you see the potential for greater, greater conflict. And this is why the portfolio has gotten so much more complicated uh, over the last uh, six, seven years and why a myopic deal is so problematic. Michael, how do we deal with the malign behavior um, within the context of any possible return to the table? Well, you know, I think that we, we can't forget the big picture as well. And the big picture is the United States under now successive administrations, and I think it won't be any different under this administration, wants to shift priorities towards Asia, uh, towards Russia to some extent, uh, which means ultimately fewer resources and, and less attention for the Middle East. And, and I think that really sort of underscores the importance, not just of the, the types of actions that, that John is talking about to counter Iran, but also the things we can do to A, strengthen the abilities, the capabilities of our allies in the region so that they can start taking on more of the burden uh, of addressing some of these regional issues themselves, but B, also improving their abilities to, to work jointly together, um, not just in the sort of diplomatic and economic realms, but also in the security realm. And here, I think actually, in a sense, one of the most important things the previous administration did on this file was not so much the, the, the sanctions and all the things with which they're, they're so associated, but it's really the Abraham Accords. It's really these uh, uh, pushing these agreements uh, between Israel and Bahrain, the UAE, Sudan, et cetera, um, and trying to, to build up what is essentially a regional security network, um, which is joined with the United States, but doesn't necessarily... Uh, require the United States to always 
um, be the prime mover, always, always be taking the lead. This, is, I, this, I think, is really an opportunity that the Biden administration should look to build on. Because the ideal situation is, A, these states are strong enough to deter Iran by denial, in a sense, to deny Iran opportunities to meddle uh, in the affairs of their neighbors, and B, are also strong enough to act to address uh, threats coming from places like Syria, uh, Iraq, and elsewhere. That, I think, is really the goal. That, again, takes long-term, consistent work across administrations. And again, is a reason why I think we have to have a good bipartisan foundation for our policy towards Iran, but also, more broadly, our policy in the region. And we have to approach every element of the policy in that manner. Uh, Jonathan, let's pick up on that for a second about a regional uh, security uh, arrangement. Um, every couple of weeks, uh, you, you read about... Uh, a suggestion that there be some kind of, of alliance uh, between Israel and its, its friends in the Gulf states um, because of concern over what might happen with another uh, a negotiation on a, on a second uh, JCPOA. Um, what's the likelihood of, of this happening, do you think, uh, given uh, the, the pace at which this seems to be moving? Look, I, I, it's, it's very hard to obviously predict the future in the Middle East, but I, I would say that we already have an alliance, a de facto alliance, right, with the Emiratis, the Bahrainis, the Israelis. You're seeing intelligence cooperation. You're seeing other cooperation. It was under the table. It's now above the table, which is great. And I think uh, that may in and of itself uh, provide a little bit of a sense of deterrence. My real concern right now about a Middle East strategic alliance or some kind of Arab NATO or Middle East NATO is actually what just happened with Saudi Arabia this week. Um, the decision by the United States to really target the Saudis. And of course, there was ample reason for doing so on human rights grounds. We're talking about the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. But uh, two years later, um, the US releases a report in response to really nothing in particular. Um, you know, uh, visa bans on a number of, uh, of senior Saudi officials, a designation of, a, of another Saudi official, all of this really placing great strain on Saudi Arabia um, and the relationship with the United States. It was not going to be terrific in the first place, and it's obviously already under strain because of the Iran nuclear negotiations or the potential thereof. Um, the problem now is that we don't know where the Saudis are. They may feel that all the reforms that they have enacted, all of the sort of changes that we've seen uh, have been for naught in terms of how the United States views them, how the Biden administration views them. They see another four to eight years of strain uh, potentially with this administration. And it does raise questions about whether they want to double down on behavior that was being broadly encouraged by the Trump administration to engage with Israel. Of course, Saudi Arabia was really in the background with all of the Abraham Accords participants, right? The Saudis were the senior partner of the Emiratis, the Bahrainis, the Moroccans, et cetera. So the, the Saudis played an important behind the scenes role in, in helping to forge these peace agreements. Um, and I still see them as the backbone for any regional um, kind of structure that might take shape. And so I've got real concerns now that they may be shifting gears strategically. They may be looking towards China. They may decide that they really don't want to look to the United States anymore as a senior partner and as a leader. So I've got, I would say that right now we have been thrust into some uncertainty as far as the Middle East concern is concerned. I still think that there is a solid basis for cooperation. I think UAE, Israeli ties, um, Israel, Bahrain ties, these are all very, very positive, but I don't think they would have happened without Saudi. And now I think Saudi's trajectory is very much an open question. Uh, Michael, how do you see um, the, the Saudi issue um, relating to the broader picture um, of uh, stability in the region, uh, the narrower picture as it relates to Iran? Look, I think we have a lot of difficult relationships in this region. And uh, it requires uh, balance. It requires balance between sort of speaking up um, for human rights, speaking up for uh, the values which, which we believe are, are important, but also um, trying to preserve these relationships, um, not, not just uh, for the sake of kind of, uh, you know, whatever interests we may have, but because, you know, having influence and, and having these partnerships is really the best way to uh, uh, influence these countries over time. Uh, as Jonathan said, you know, 
um, we wouldn't want to see them sort of drift away from the West, drift away from the United States, um, because then we would also we would undermine both our interests and lose the opportunity to exercise influence uh, over their trajectory. So, so I do think that we we need to um, be able to maintain our regional partnerships and alliances, and, and in fact strengthen them um, as we try to, as I said, not just do things like counter Iran, which will continue to be very important, prevent Iran from getting nuclear weapons in particular. But as we seek to execute this shift uh, in priorities towards Asia, towards uh, Russia, towards strategic competition with, with great powers, as it were, uh, in general, um, working through our regional partners will become even more important. And we've seen elements of that, for example, in Syria. That's going to, again, require patience. Uh, and it's a word I've used a lot. Um, it's going to require time. Uh, and it's going to be incremental. We're going to have to take baby steps. I'd like to see, for example, more cooperation on missile defense uh, in the Gulf. Um, I'd like to see uh, perhaps some joint counterterrorism exercises. You know, we, we can take small steps forward that, again, if pursued over time, will have a big effect uh, on American interests for the better. Um, it's, it's going to be a bumpy road in this region. I, I think we have seen that many times. And it's not just with respect to the Saudi relationship, which is very important. Um, our relationships with Turkey, with Egypt, and so forth are, are equally difficult, I would say, even though they get a little bit less attention right now. Um, but being able to preserve those relationships and sort of guide them through um, those difficulties is, is what diplomacy and what foreign policy is all about. Well, I have a final question, uh, and it relates to, uh, to Hezbollah. Um, the threat that uh, Iran poses as a state uh, exporter of terror, of course, well-documented. Um, and we've talked about Yemen uh, and Lebanon. Um, but in terms of, of Lebanon, in terms of Hezbollah, um, with it having carried out attacks as far away as, as Argentina, the Amia bombing back in, in the mid-1990s, and with uh, Bulgaria, for example, in, in Burgas uh, in, in 2012, the EU's response uh, to all of that uh, was, if you'll recall, to bifurcate Hezbollah uh, into two wings, a military and political wing, um, allowing it to operate on EU soil uh, under the guise of, of the political wing. Now, some European countries are beginning now uh, to designate Hezbollah as a terrorist organization in all of its parts. Um, and what do you make of this, this split as to why this was done? And um, uh, how, just how important do you think it is now to send a message? You know, we saw with the explosion in the Beirut port, uh, you know, the uh, premature, uh, you know, uh, suggestions that perhaps Hezbollah finally would, you know, could be brought to heel because of its activity. Nothing really ever happened. But how important is it to, to make sure that these designations are clear and not uh, uh, amorphous in, in any way, um, either one or both? Jonathan? Sure. I mean, look, you're, you're obviously referring to the sort of small wave that we saw last year of countries uh, in Europe, and I guess also um, Honduras, if memory serves, um, also designated uh, Hezbollah in its entirety. And of course, this is a welcome... Uh, step the idea that there is a political wing and a military wing of Hezbollah in the first place is something of a of a construct that I think uh, a doesn't reflect reality and b probably reflects um, a uh, an effort on the part of some of these countries to try to still shape the environment in Lebanon to still gain access in Lebanon. The reason why this is so necessary, at least in their eyes, um, I don't think that 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 it's necessarily something they should be doing, but the, the goal here is to try to have influence in the country itself. And in the country itself, we see Lebanon as the power broker. Um, they are the, the, they're the power brokers in the financial center, which by the way, we should just note, they have driven uh, the Lebanese economy to bankruptcy. I mean, this is an insolvent state right now with more than $90 billion worth of debt due to the fact that Hezbollah has infiltrated the banking system. The political system is flatlined because of Hezbollah's participation. Um, the country is actually, I would say, closer to Somalia um, than, um, than anyone probably realizes. You could see a real collapse. So I think um, you're going to see a number of European countries that still try to engage, that still try to work with Hezbollah as a political actor, because, of course, uh, they have established themselves as such. 
But we cannot forget the fact that this is an organization that was created and stood up by Iran as a means to engage in war with Israel. It is a proxy of Iran through and through. They answer to Iran. In fact, you know, when Iran dispatched Hezbollah to Syria uh, to defend Iran's interests, Hezbollah answered the call. So um, it is a false construct, but um, one that I suppose is going to be hard to erase entirely but a good sign that more countries are moving in the right, right direction, treating Hezbollah as a terrorist organization in its entirety. I think the real question right now is how to extricate Hezbollah from Lebanon. Can it be done? Um, you know, can you really engage in sort of chemotherapy um, or kind of a surgical approach to removing Hezbollah? My sense is that it may be too far gone. There are many analysts, I would say at this point, that agree with that assessment. Uh, and that is a real problem because what that ultimately means is likely a conflict after Hezbollah really suffocates whatever was left of the pragmatists um, and uh, and moderates within the country. Now, Michael, how do you see the uh, the issue of Hezbollah and, and how it's been viewed, particularly in Europe? And I, I, I ask the question because it, it is very closely related to uh, what I had asked earlier about the European position on Iran writ large uh, and how it might play itself out at a, at a JCPOA table. But uh, your take on, on, on this particular issue. My view is as well as a terrorist group, there is no distinction between political and military wings and every European country should have Hezbollah listed as a terrorist organization. And frankly, I would challenge my European friends to point to um, any particularly positive outcome or benefit of this policy of refraining from uh, calling out Hezbollah in order to engage them over these past 15, 20 uh, plus years um, that this policy has been in place. Um, and frankly, I, I think that we also haven't seen uh, sufficient action to enforce uh, Resolution 1701 at the UN Security Council, um, which should prevent uh, countries from sending arms uh, and money and so forth to Hezbollah. You know, when when the UN arms embargo on Iran was expiring, one of the things we heard um, uh, from many parties of the JCPOA was, well, you know, we can mitigate this because there are these other arms embargoes in place on the Houthis uh, in Yemen, uh, on Hezbollah in Lebanon. That's a that's a good argument if you enforce those arms embargoes. And so those who want to see um, the JCPOA, for example, proceed and operate should be equally zealous about enforcing those UN Security Council resolutions. And, and that would be my very simple message for, for our European colleagues and, and, and others around the world. We have seen progress um, in terms of European states' attitudes towards Hezbollah. Uh, and this is where I sort of return to my um, point on diplomacy and engagement. It should, should have been much faster. It should have been much quicker. But it has been the result of the persistence, not just of US diplomats across administrations, uh, but also of others, you know, um, uh, scholars and, and sort of analysts going to these European capitals, engaging uh, in the debate uh, on the sort of uh, substance of, of their arguments uh, and so forth. And that's something that we need to continue to do. So we need to continue to enforce the right policy ourselves, um, which is which is certainly to treat Hezbollah as beyond the pale. Uh, they're not, as Jonathan noted, just a Lebanese political actor, um, but they're a sort of expeditionary uh, uh, militia in Syria, Iraq uh, and elsewhere. Um, doing their own fighting, but also training uh, other groups uh, to, in a way which has been very destabilizing for the Middle East. Um, but at the same time, we need to be able to go and engage in that um, diplomatic argument uh, in places like Europe and in Asia and, and so forth to ensure that that sort of this position becomes more widespread. Uh, I think we've seen some gains. It, need, it needs to frankly go faster. Well, Jonathan, Michael, we appreciate uh, very much your sharing your insights concerning Iran, its uh, behavior in the region and around the globe, and uh, the future of the JCPOA. I know our viewers certainly um, have appreciated your critical analysis uh, on these issues and hope we can come back. We can continue to take the temperature some months from now uh, on the issues that, uh, that we've just discussed. So thanks for being with us today. Thank you. Bye, Dan. Thank you to the Foundation for Defense of Democracy Senior Vice President Jonathan Chanzer and Managing Director of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, Michael Singh, for bringing their knowledge and perspectives to our conversation on the future of Iran policy. And thank you for tuning in to this expert analysis conversation with B'nai B'rith. 
If you enjoyed this discussion, make sure you never miss a program by subscribing to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel, liking us on Facebook, and following us on Twitter. And be sure to visit our website, B'nai to learn more about our important work. See you again soon. Take care.